Bernard from the Norwich Bookstore, but obviously we're all doing this event from home. And um, while the bookstore is not open for browsing at this point, we are happy to take orders by phone or email or the web for either shipment or pickup, uh, contact free pickup from the porch so that we can um, get you your holiday gifts. We uh, really enjoy being your personal shoppers, either by phone or email. And um, we thank you for joining us this evening. And we, um, we're asking that the uh, video and the audio stay off so it's not distracting to the speakers. And um, we re recommend, it's gonna be a little different while the slideshow is going on, but we recommend that you choose the speaker option and then turn on the chat option, which is the bottom at the bottom of your screen. And there you'll see links to the books and you can add your um, questions and comments. Um, there will be autographed copies of his book available in Kanaka and Christmas. And uh, this event will be recorded and posted to the website later so you can share it with your friends and family. And just briefly, the format for this evening is I'm going to stop talking and disappear for a little bit. And the bookstore co-owner, Penny McConnell, will give a brief introduction of our guest, Bill Noble. And then he'll do a presentation and followed by a conversation with Penny. And then we invite you to put your um, questions in the chat box. And towards the end of the program, I'll jump back on again and share those questions with our speakers. We ask you to keep those questions to general about the book and gardening in general, as opposed to specific something to your garden how-to, just so everybody can stay involved in the, in the conversation. So without further ado, Penny, it's yours. Hi, Bill, welcome. This seems kind of funny. It was, I liked it a little better out in the summer sunny garden back there in the summer of 2020, but we're happy to be able to do this. I think this is part five or six of the Bill Noble Norwich Bookstore whatever, road show, I guess it's what it is. You know, I was thinking, I don't know when we first met. I, I have an idea, but it seems as if my gym and you and your gym, we've been friends forever through several dogs and several uh, different versions of your garden, which we will get into later, but I'm really excited to have you here. It's, um, it's a little harder to introduce somebody who I know than it is to just, they did this, they went there, blah, blah, blah. So I'm just going to keep this to the dull, the not dull, the very exciting minimum. And um, just mention that you started gardening, I believe, in Cornish with a far, uh, kind of like a farmer's garden, and you started a farmer's market. Then after that, you went pretty quickly to work at St. Gaudens and then to the Fells. And then, and I don't remember what year it was, you started, you became the, uh, let's see, the director of preservation for the Garden Conservancy, which you did for a long time. And now you are a consultant in garden design and preservation, as well as a public garden manager. So these jobs have kept you busy and given you the opportunity to travel all around the country and the world a bit and bring back plants to your own garden, which I'm interested in hearing about. Um, so before we get started, I want to suggest to everybody that you do what I did when I read this book. I read the book twice, once in manuscript form with my pen and my paper right next to me because I was taking notes all the time. And then when I got the copy of the finished beautiful book that I'm staring at right in front of me with that lovely cover, uh, I read it again. It was, my, it was my June escape from COVID book. Instead of reading a novel or something, I took it to the bed side and read it every night before I went to bed and I took notes which I then immediately set to work reorganizing and imagining my whole garden. So I suggest you all do that. And also I want you to all remember that this book makes a perfect gift and you could probably knock off two or three people with in, not one book but one book the same book for every one of them. So other than that let's move ahead to Bill. Well, thank you, Penny, and thank you, Eliza, and it, it's great to know that we've been friends for such a long, long time that you've taken um, my book to your bedside, <laughs> and our friendship continues to develop. But anyway, this has been an extraordinary time to launch a book, and, um, and I've been happy to work with two extraordinary booksellers with Liza and Penny, who 
um, we first started talking about launching the book with a talk at the bookstore in May when it was going to be published. And I remember standing in Central Park, having a long conversation with Penny, figuring that all out. And then everything changed. And, um, and one of the great changes in this world is um, friendships deepening and friendships becoming collaborations to help launch the book. So thank you, Liza, and thank you, Penny. We can talk more about the launch of the book too, because I think that's an interesting story, but it's, it's not where I wanna begin. Uh, where I would like to begin is to just say a few words um, about my background and um, some of the gardens that have inspired me and taught me in the making of this own garden. And then um, I want to uh, look at what I call guiding principles, which are in the book. They're sort of a small couple of pages of a sidebar, um, but they're a good way of, of framing an introduction to this garden. And then I'm gonna do a really quick, too quick romp through some of the uh, parts of the garden. And then we'll get, uh, and then we'll get into a conversation and, uh, questions and a, and a conversation. But um, I moved to the Upper Valley in the 1970s. I didn't know you and Jim in the 1970s, but um, after a failed uh, uh, graduate student career in Toronto, a friend and I moved uh, to Lebanon in 1976. And I tried my hand at a uh, a variety of occupations. I was a community organizer for Listen. I was a woodworker in Heartland. And then I had this overwhelming desire to be outside, to work outside. And I um, began farming 10 acres in Cornish and Windsor and uh, collaborated with some friends in, in starting the Cornish farmer's market and having a, a roadside stand and clearing $5,000 at the end of my first year and being really proud of that. And then not long after clearing $5,000 at the end of another year and deciding that it was time to sell the tractor and, and, and find something else. And I really lucked into uh, a seasonal position working at the St. Gaudens National Historic Park. Um, I don't think I need to introduce St. Gaudens or the park or the Cornish colony um, to, to this group, but, um, uh, but it was an introduction to me into another world, a world of artists, gardeners, and, um, and you know, the, the job was uh, a job that required manual labor and sweat, but it was one that was... Um, was really life-changing for me because what I got to do was to learn about gardening, ornamental horticulture by working in the garden of an artist, of a sculptor who sculpted space with pine and hemlock saplings that were dug from the roadsides and birch trees that were dug from, uh, from open fields. And uh, and he created volume and space and worked with light and with flowers and with plants. But I learned about sort of the uh, an artistic approach here to gardening. And then I had the good fortune to work with a number of other um, owners, successors of other Cornish colony gardens, um, especially with Joan and Charlie Platt at their garden, um, which had been made in the 19, in the 1890s by uh, Charles Platt, who was a landscape painter and an architect and who studied Italian Renaissance gardens, wrote the first book in English on Italian Renaissance gardens, and then came back to Cornish and built a house and created a garden uh, with this setting. And here he, he learned from the Renaissance principles how to take a very formal structured garden and by sculpting the land in the middle ground, make the garden relate to that long view down the Connecticut River Valley. And then I worked with the owners of Northcote, Stephen Parrish's garden, also in Cornish. Um, and this was a garden that 
was made by an artist who had put aside his art and for 10 years uh, put all of his energy into creating this garden and kept journals and photographed it and had wonderful correspondence with nursery people, all of which is in Rauner Library at Dartmouth. And so I got to sit down and really get into the mind and the soul of an artist gardener uh, in, the, in that garden. And then after a while, I wanted to stretch my wings and I went to work at the Fells on Lake Sunapee in Newberry for the Garden Conservancy. And there I learned uh, about a different approach to gardening, um, not one that was trying to create um, the illusion of an Italian hillside, but one that really celebrated the rocky New Hampshire pastures and, and hillsides. And I got to work with Clarence Hayes' extraordinary rock garden that really feels like it's part of the scene on, uh, on Lake Sunapee. And then shortly after that, I took a job as director of preservation for the Garden Conservancy based in Cold Spring, New York. So I was for 15 or more years, I was commuting from Norwich to the, the Hudson Valley. But more than that, I was, I was getting to meet some of the most extraordinary contemporary gardens, gardeners in this country and, and to see their gardens, such as Ion Chase's garden here um, in the foothills of Mount Rainier. And I learned how Mrs. Chase loved the alpine meadows of Mount Rainier, but couldn't grow those special plants at a lower elevation, but painted these pictures that referred to the alpine meadows on Mount Rainier in her lowland beautiful garden dating from the 1950s and, and 60s. And then I've also worked with gardeners like George Shulkoff, who was inspired by Sissinghurst and Hidcote to create his masterpiece in Washington, Connecticut. And I continued to be amazed by this garden. And it's a garden that is really a Connecticut garden, but it's also an English garden. It's, it's a really complicated, beautiful um, piece of art. But that's the rest of the story. Um, in the early 1990s, my partner Jim Tatum and I um, wanted to move out from uh, Union Village where we were in a really cold, dark hollow. And Jim found us this house uh, up on the top of Bragg Hill in the summer of 1991. And let's see, I'm having trouble finding where to, where to forward. But anyway, this, so the story is that um, we almost lost this house. We, we tried to purchase it. We were turned down. Many months later, um, the sellers came back to us. So um, how fortuitous um, to find this house that had been lived in for decades by Betty and Bob McKenzie. And so we knew that there was something special here. We didn't know just how special or really what it was. And over the last 30 years, we've learned some things. So this photograph comes from the Historical Society and it shows uh, the Mackenzie Farm in the middle um, 1950s with Mr. Mackenzie with his team uh, in the field there. And then I learned that um, some of the special things about this place are the views, its location. We're about three miles from town. Who knew that there was something like this? this close to Dan and Witz, um, but um, we're at 1150 feet. We own 22 acres, 10 of which is, is field that is still farmed by Mike and Gertie Luce. Uh, 10 acres of it is, is woodland and two or three acres is developed around the house. Um, for those of you who know gardening in this region, you know that we can have temperatures down into the low minus 20s or up into the upper 90s, both of which we've experienced this year. But the, the soil is good soil. It's good loam and it's recognized as prime uh, Vermont agricultural soils. So Betty McKenzie died in the house at age 90. She had gardened here since the 1920s. Um, some of her gardens and plants remained, others she had put to bed, um, but there was a process of cleanup. 
and um, and that cleanup uh, involved pulling a lot of um, blackberries and brambles out of the roses and shrubs that Betty had planted here. So part of what's special about her as a gardener, I think, is that she came from Massachusetts and was trying to push the zones and, and grow some plants that, that weren't common plants in the Upper Valley in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. So Coquitsia, the beauty bush, and that yellow rose is hers. That's the yellow rose of, of Texas. Um, and then I learned that um, there was more to this place with these beautiful granite capstones on the walls and 100 year old maple trees and apple trees, a uh, probably state champion President Lincoln Lilac planted by the Mackenzies in the, in the 1920s in front of the one remaining barn. And then apple trees are a real signifying characteristic of this property. So in cleaning up, I started to make some decisions to figure out where I was going to head with the garden. And one, one decision was, was pretty clear. And that was the, the front garden that Betty McKenzie had made would become my garden. And I would leave her garden alone and do what I could to fertilize and prune and encourage. And, and so the, the roadside garden uh, remains Betty McKenzie's garden. But I knew that the challenges were going to be in the back. And uh, when Jim brought me to show me this place, my jaw dropped when I walked out onto this deck and saw the enormity of the view, as well as some of the screening challenges that were going to be uh, that were going to be necessary. But what this talk is about is the journey from this photograph to this photograph and the almost 30 years in between. And that story is one of love of this place, love of the people that I live with and that I work with here. And it's also autobiographical. Um, there's the vegetable garden that harks back to the 10 acres of, 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 of roadside vegetable growing and a flower garden that harkens back to Stephen Parrish's and, the, and some of the Cornish gardens. So when I talk about guiding principles, um, some of the things that I think about um, are that I want the garden to feel like a natural outgrowth of the place and to harmonize with the vernacular architecture and its architectural character. We love this house, but it's a humble house. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a country cape. It's not an in-town fancy house. And so it doesn't want a fancy garden. It wants a garden that is true to the character of the architecture and of the topography and of the place. And then I also saw that the best views were to the, uh, to, to the east. That earlier slide showed you um, views over the Connecticut River Valley to Moose Mountain and then up to Smarts Mountain. And so that's, that's what we're seeing here. But then I wanted to develop uh, aspects of the garden to really focus one's eye on the, on the long view as well as on the sky. We have really big skies here and it's one of the really wonderful things about this place. And then there's a view to Vermont Pastoral Hillside um, to the Northeast. And I wanted to feature and focus on that. And then taking a page from Ione Chase's garden, uh, this, this planting in the stable in one of the barn foundations um, harkens to the tops of those hillsides to Smarts and Musilock that now that I spend so much time gardening here, I don't get to, to walk on, but the, but the junipers and the low bush blueberries and the grasses that are so beautiful, such a beautiful part of the New Hampshire hilltop landscape um, have been brought down uh, into this lower elevation. So I also said that I really wanted to take advantage of the, um, the ruins, the foundations of the three barns that had all collapsed and mostly been 
um, buried or carted off either before we came or early on. So this near view is in the stable. Um, the colorful mid view um, stepping up is the rock garden in what had been the milking parlor. And then beyond that where the birches and the poplars are had been a 70 foot long hay barn. And then I knew that we needed to, to do some screening. That house that I showed you next door was Marv and Mary Scouten's house. And we became really good friends and neighbors with Marv and Mary, but um, we all agreed that um, we didn't wanna be um, monitoring uh, one another's presence in our backyards. And so some screening was necessary. And, um, and I, I spent some time in the book talking about some of the uh, choices and the decisions that went into the evergreen screening. Um, but then my friend, the landscape architect, uh, Alan Saucier suggested a orchard of apples um, on a grid with the existing apple trees. And I don't think either one of us um, realized just how beautiful that scene would be in May. But I also made some early mistakes and um, and I decided I needed to do a master plan. And so I uh, measured the location of the house and the barns and the road and the, and the, exist, the existing structures. And then um, a, a plan fell into place uh, pretty quickly. Um, but what you're seeing here is the end papers from the book and uh, those two gray rectangles to the left are the house and you step off the deck behind the middle a uh, rectangle to the deck and the view over the vegetable garden and the flower garden and looking down as the field slopes away. And then you move to the right or to the west to an open lawn and a long border and then the uh, barn foundations above that. And then I also said that the um, the plant should be the primary means for creating structure and interest rather than architecture or garden ornament. And part of that was this um, uh, recognition that this is a sort of a humble Vermont hillside, um, but also the recognition that our, my budget didn't allow for large plants or, uh, or, or structure. And then the decision was made that the vegetable garden, there was only one place for the vegetable garden and that got um, set in the ground right below um, the deck, which is not where the books tell you you should plant a vegetable garden, but there it is. Um, but I've made it relate to the flower garden beyond. And the poplars are an important aspect of that flower garden. They help ground it and to also um, draw one's attention to the whole ensemble. And um, at that, it, and one's attention often goes to the shimmering leaves of the poplars when you're sitting on the deck or at dinner and Penny and Jim have certainly experienced that where you don't see the flowers of the garden, but you just get the, the rustling uh, and the peacefulness of the, of the poplars. And then there was very little shade here. Um, and also we're really close to the road. Um, so inspired by the birch grove at St. Gaudens, um, I planted a grove of paper birch in what had been the barn, the barnyard. And then in the stable, I've, I've mentioned that, um, but really the thing about the stable is that something I learned from Ellen Shipman, one of the Cornish gardeners, what is that there always needed to be a green oasis, a place where one could escape to and to be oneself. And, uh, and so I wanted a place away from the excitement of the flower garden and, and some place where I could retire just by myself or with Jim or with a special guest or, or with a dog. And, and that's this place. And then, I said that um, the garden needed to be designed and maintained according to ecological principles and sustainability as I understand them, and that I wanted to enhance habitat, habitats for the benefit 
of wildlife and that native plants should be employed where, the, where they're the best choice and to build an environment rich in, in native plants. But it's also where I experiment with plants brought back um, in suitcases and, um, and overhead bins from my travels to North Carolina and California and the Pacific Northwest and, and other places. And so I've collected a number of different types of, of shrubs, shrubs, perennials, rock garden plants over the years. But I've made, um, made a point of not allowing this to become a collector's garden, but really to focus on um, the experience of some beautiful plants in a setting that feels natural and appropriate. Bill? Yes. Can, can I interrupt you? Sure. Because you came, that's a perfect segue into something that I've been wanting to talk about, which is the collection and the, the plants in the suitcase. Because I've always thought, I, in the beginning of your, as you go into your area of your garden and the shed there, there's always plants. And there's just always, every time you come back from someplace, there's more and more there. And I think, where is he going to put them? So I'm, I'm curious, first of all, how you brought those plants back. If you brought them back um, thinking, well, I don't know if these are going to work, but they're probably not my zone, but maybe they will work. And what that all has to do with collection, because I, you, you talk a lot about the collections. And of course, you you don't have one garden. I think you have 10 gardens, if I count them all correctly. There's 10 very different gardens that all create a whole. So is that too many questions at once? Is that? Well, come back to me because there's a lot there. There's a lot there. And, and I think it's a lot of interest for, uh, for other gardeners. So um, I think the, the place to start is that um, I, you know, I mentioned I, I've had the privilege of meeting some really extraordinary gardeners. So people like Nancy Goodwin in, in North Carolina, who said to me, Bill, um, look at these hellebores here. Here's hellebore sniger. I think that that would work for you in Vermont. I didn't have any hellebores in my garden until Nancy said, why don't you, why don't you, why don't you try it? Cyclamen, she also, um, she also mentioned. So I'm now collecting both of those because I've had great success with them. Um, how they got here, um, many of them were purchased um, in North Carolina and in Oregon and in Washington state and some in California and a bunch of other places. Um, but there's, I think, a great congruity between Oregon and Vermont. It, the people, the culture, the interest in gardening, and the plants. There are many plants that do well in gardens there that also do well here. And, um, and many of those plants weren't available on the East Coast. And so I would seek out specialty nurseries. I would buy. I would buy smallish. I would carry an extra backpack with me on those trips. The night before flying home, I would wrap those small um, pots in newspaper. I would jam them into the backpack. Sometimes there was an extra shopping bag. Um, the stewardesses and the stewards always had a smile on their face when they saw me coming through. I never once got questioned about carrying plants on airplanes and actually people have helped me <laughs> carry extra bags. Um, and then the other thing to mention is that this garden, you know, was put together in the nine in the 90s and the and after the turn of the century, when there were some really fabulous specialty nurseries in our world. And many of those are now gone. But this garden has benefited from East uh, from well, E.C. Brown's nursery, but from Katie's Falls nursery, from plant and and from many mail order nurseries, and also it's it's uh, I have found in giving these talks that people are are a little reluctant to order by mail order sometimes um, because the plants not might not be of our zone, um, but 
uh, Oregon and California growers are very good about listing zones. Um, they're often wrong. Um, they'll often say something is zone six when uh, this is, a, I didn't say earlier, this is a zone four garden, zone four B. Um, what do they know? I mean, there aren't all that many zone four B gardeners that are experimenting. And I just really encourage people to experiment. Um, and, and, you know, if, if, if one of the things that the book can do is if you just look at the index, um, you can see some of the plants that have survived in this, in this garden. I didn't write about too many plants that, that just didn't survive. And actually I've, um, in all the years I've been carrying plants back, there, there are very few that have succumbed to um, winter cold. It's, it's other things, it could be insects or or bowls <laughs> that get that get things. Anyway, very long answer, Penny. So, so what about palette? Well, if we want to look at this photograph, exactly. Um, so, you've seen pictures of very colorful gardens here. Um, but what gives me the greatest pleasure is foliage and working with foliage and working with the foliage of what you see here are conifers, uh, perennials, uh, some common ones, some ferns, and um, European ginger. So I like um, the uh, experimentation to see what thrives and to match plants that want similar conditions, but also have something uh, to say one another in conversation where this really fine textured foliage in the foreground is a plant from Korea and that conifer behind it is also from Korea. And I haven't made a study of the flora of Korea, but I would love to go to Korea because I think, I think there are things to learn from, from that flora and to bring here. So palette, um, uh, so foliage. And part of the thing about foliage for me is a, a long season, a long season of interest. Um, and that's something that I learned at St. Gaudens that Ellen Shipman um, orchestrated the flower garden at St. Gaudens so that it would be in bloom from Memorial Day to Columbus Day. And that's a challenge, um, but it's a challenge that we can uh, rise to here. And um, if you wanted, I could flip a few slides down and look at the flower garden as that goes through the long season. Yeah, go for it. If, if you wanna do that, and then we'll come back to more conversation. And then we can come back to any of these other photos that you want to. But so here's the flower garden. Um, I call it the flower garden, but um, taking the cue from Stephen Parrish, um, his flower garden had conifers and trees and shrubs and cutback shrubs and vines and roses and perennials and half-hearted perennials and tropicals and annuals and bulbs. Well, I don't have, I don't have quite all of those, but I have, uh, a fair number of, of plants, the conifers and shrubs and vines and roses that create structure. And I could be showing you a photograph of this, this same view in early May, and I like it almost as much as this view in later May, which is when the first floral flush um, comes up out of the structure. But then we go to June and we get kind of traditional, the Winglandy in June with, uh, with Siberian iris and bearded iris and peonies and phlox and delphinium in July and the Cornish hollyhocks in July into August. And then, and then the garden kind of slows down and I take up interest again in it in late August after the heat of the summer when I'm just as happy to go to the lake. Um, but I love um, the late August and September garden with the Joe Pieweed and the Phloxes and the Menardas, but the, um, the foliage of the shrubs 
um, becomes more saturated and more interesting. And then you can go into, uh, this is an October scene and um, there's been very little cleanup to, to create this, um, this scene. So, I mean, this year, um, we, I mean, the, this part of the garden was showing wonderfully into, into November. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you know, I, I don't know if it's because I'm older, but something's happened in the last couple of years and I have fallen in love with the change. I don't care that much about the height of summer in the garden. I, there's something about the fall and the fading, but not fading because there's great colors in the fall. I love that time. You said something that I've never thought of before, but I've realized I've thought of it constantly conversation the plants have a conversation that's brilliant it's brilliant okay okay so, okay so good I'm, i made something up this evening so that's so that's oh, good no, i love we, that i love we that could do, we could do something with that so yeah. you started to talk about you mentioned somewhere about invasive plants and um we didn't really i didn't know the term invasive plant when i started my garden here 26 years ago five years ago. And, and now we're, ha we're finding that, my God, you've got some invasive plant in your garden. Am I supposed to tear it out? What are your thoughts about that? Well, my thoughts are that a lot of, of current thinking is that gardens ought to be two thirds native and one third exotic. So that's an interesting concept. I, do, I, don't, think, uh, I don't think my garden is there yet, but it's probably not that far away from it. But um, the garden does have, uh, let's see, I wanted to go back. The garden does have some invasive plants. That barberry is an invasive plant. It's illegal to sell in Vermont, New Hampshire. Um, I agree that that's a good thing, that it's illegal to sell because, I, I mean, I drove up to Barnard the other day and there's acres of understory that is taken over by barberry. Um, I keep a pretty close eye on these barberries. Um, the, green, the green barberries seed very freely. The red barberries hardly in, in my garden, and that's my only experience with these. Um, once every few years, I'll find a few seedlings that the chipmunks have buried, but uh, these red ones don't. Uh, don't seed. Um, there are some other uh, Asian invasive plants that are in this garden or were in the, in the garden. There, were, there was red currant and when I realized that that was seeding across the road that got ripped out. Um, there's sorbaria, the false ural uh, spirea, and that's an, a really old Vermont barnyard plant and that's why I planted it. Um, I regret that it's uh, it's it's something that takes a lot of work to uh, to to keep it in to keep it in bounds, but um, I think the most important thing to say about invasive plants is to really study your own plants and your own garden, your and the and the places that you care about, and if you see something that that's ill behaved, then do something about it. But um, but I think that monitoring and and using a gardener's brain um, is 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 my approach. That's all I'm going to say. It's my approach. That, I have coveted that red barberry every every year. I see that and I think, oh God. I mean, because it it's such a focal point, but it blends in so beautifully, and everything fits right around it. It's. And, and it's a great pollinator plant. It is full of bees in, in May. You're doing good. Yeah. It's, you're doing good. What about native plants? Well, um, I, I mentioned uh, cleaning up around the house. Um, and one of the things that I noticed when I was cleaning up around the house and pulling out the brambles is that um, the bird song and the bird life that uh, I had noticed here the first year we moved in um, that that kind of dissipated after I was doing all my cleaning up. So um, 
in recompense, <laughs> um, I mean, the I mean, it was really easy to make the decision that I wanted to plant native plants, especially those that would attract bird life, um, birds to the house and to the margins of the of the garden. So from early on, um, uh, the choosing native plants and ones that really had demonstrable value for uh, native fauna. Um, I mean, early on, it was mostly birds that I was paying attention to. And a lot of us have, have uh, shifted our focus and are also looking at invertebrates now. Um, and that requires a different strategy, but uh, the native plants sort of had that purpose. But also the other thing that I could have mentioned early on is that um, I view this place as a laboratory because I'm doing garden design. And so I want to I want to plant plants. Um, I want to push the boundaries and then I want to see what thrives and I want to know how big it's going to get or how much trouble it's going to be or what care it's going to be or what kind of beauty it's going to produce. Yeah, there's so much. Um, I, mistakes is not the right word. I've had so many plants in my garden that I moved or I got rid of are so many different changes that happened to them. And I, they're just all opportunities to uh, do something else. Well, let, um, me, let me move forward and look at some other opportunities. Um, yeah. Then I go to the, so this is the, the rock garden. And um, I can't tell you how many plants I brought back from the West Coast or ordered from specialty rock garden nurseries and lost in this, gar in this garden. Um, I, I thought that this was well-drained. I mean, most of those plants need uh, a, a well-draining soil if they need any soil at all. They just, they hate water, uh, standing in water. And I lost so many plants, uh, so many alpine plants in the, in the rock garden. And then I saw that I needed to take some other strategies. And, uh, and so these troughs are where some of the uh, saxifrages and primulas, and some other plants that really want sharp, good drainage. Um, so they have found a, a house in those troughs and these are, are pretty easy to take care of and they're, they're just so satisfying. Um, and then the other thing to say is that I, I figured out um, that where I put my rock garden was the wrong place for a rock garden. And I was, I was trying to learn alpine plants when I was working at the fells. And so there were a lot of hit, hits or misses, but finally I found this one spot um, that has really good morning sun. It's it's protected from the heat of the afternoon and the humidity, which is what al alpines hate, heat and humidity. Um, but uh, there's kind of, but the soil stays moist and the drainage is good. So what am I, what am I saying here is, is that um, experimentation is kind of the lifeblood of gardening. Yeah. All right, well, I think with that, I'm gonna say thank you very, 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 very much. Turn it over to Liza and um, some questions from our audience. You there, Liza? I'm here. I'm here. We we don't have a lot of questions, so we'll have to. You'll you don't don't go anywhere, Penny. But the the, the first question that we have here. No, is, wait, wait, wait. It's don't go anywhere, Bill. Well, no, Bill's not going to go anywhere. But you're not going to go anywhere. <laughs> I'm not either. <laughs> um, no, Bill's Bill's stuck. Um, the, this this question is is sort of a process question and. Um, it's, it's when, during the season, how much time are you spending in your own garden and, and hiring help? And how does that, how does that pan out? Um, thank you for using the word help. Um, I, uh, I was just about earlier to mention Susan Howard, um, who is um, part of the lifeblood of this, of this garden. And um, Sue has worked with me every Friday here since the late 1990s. And Sue brings an extraordinary eye and dedication and accomplishment as, uh, as an artist uh, gardener. 
And so uh, this garden would not be what it is with, without Sue. Um, the question of how much time I spend here is a really easy one to avoid because I don't know. I've never um, tried to track that. I've been asked it many times. Um, and the, uh, the, I mean, the simple answer is that in the early part of the season from March up until uh, mid, mid or late June, um, I'm, I'm probably spending a three full days in the garden sort of spaced out over the week or, or more. And then, as I said, I'm really happy to go to the lake in July and August. And, um, and then uh, the October and November, there's another rush of cutting back and, uh, and deer protection. And um, Sue and I are still doing that. We have one more, one more group of, of plants to uh, protect and then, and then we'll be done. But, you know, we work uh, five or six hours on a day of a day in October, November. Okay, that's that's a lot. Um, that's uh, a lot. <laughs> you know, yeah, and you know what? You know what probably takes the most time is the vegetable garden, um, and I don't begrudge that at all. We, you know, last night we had a salad out of the vegetable garden. We had arugula and radicchio. Um, we're going to have kale tomorrow. Um, the we've we've had we have eaten produce out of the vegetable garden or from the orchard every single day since May 25th this year. Mm. Wow. wow, that's impressive. That's impressive. Um, the next question, actually, there were a couple of questions about um, uh, alternatives to invasive species. First, specifically the red um, bar barberry that has a similar color and texture. Like, how do you? When you have to take something out, how do you find something that goes with 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 your painting as well? Part of the reason the barberry is there is because I haven't found that plant. <laughs> I've, I've experimented with uh, with physocarpus and wygelia, and they just don't do the same thing. And now now people are on a theme about um, there's no fences, and how do you how do you approach? Um, the the, uh, the pests like deers and groundhogs and you made a face about moles early on earlier on when you moles yeah <laughs> um, so there is no deer fence we live right on the road there's no way that a, a fence would work here and there's no way that I would want to live um, caged in a in a in a fence mm -hmm. um, there are the there are deer here. Um, this year, uh, there have been people hunting um, on, on this part of Bragg Hill, which is a good new development because it's been a few years since no one has been hunting up here. Um, but um, I'm, ver I'm very lucky. Um, what, uh, what Sue and I do is that we wrap the conifers that the deer will eat in the winter with, uh, with either deer netting or uh, or a narrow gauge fencing. And that probably takes us five or six hours to um, put up in the fall and take down in the spring. And then in the, um, in the height of the season, uh, the deer will nibble at hydrangeas and they'll maybe try the edge of the vegetable garden. And then I'll apply, I'll apply a spray and that usually um, uh, deters them for the rest of the season in that part of the garden. Woodchucks are the woodchucks are really destructive here. They've undermined walls, foundation walls. Um, they're trying to get it, the walls in, into the house, and and so um, we trap uh, we trap woodchucks. And then I've probably lost more plants to voles than any other plant because they uh, all these small plants that I've carried back from the west coast. Willows, in 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 particular, they will they'll girdle um, uh, or they'll eat this time of year or through the winter, and that's the end. That's the end of the plant. But again, it's it's about observing where you are and coming up with a specific strategy. Penny, do you have any? any yeah, yeah, but Bill, I I think I've asked you this before. And I think you were a little vague, but 
once you and Sue get this last business, the, the wrapping of the conifers done and you're totally done in the garden, do you feel any kind of, whew, I can sit back for a few, few months before we start again, or are you bummed? Well, I'm not bummed, no. Um, I just put in my vegetable seed order for next year. Already? <laughs> yeah, well, Renee's, Renee's garden had a 25%, you know. Uh, <laughs> I didn't get that email. Yeah, really yeah. So I put in my so I put in my vegetable order. I've got a a list of and it, it's a fairly short list of of plants um, to buy for next year, and um, but I'm already lining those up because this it was hard to get some plants this year, and that's going to be true next year. So um, so there's that. Um, and then there, there's going to be some pruning to there's going to be some pruning to do and uh, and I'm hoping for some snow on the ground and sunny days and not too cold and to and to really take care of some of those lilacs that that need attention. What about the hydrangeas? Do you wait until March to deal with the hydrangeas? I'll probably get to those in in January, February. I'm not going to do those early on, but um, we'll see. You know, we we. Um, I was in this garden nearly every day beginning March 15th this year. We had snowdrops and hellebores and all sorts of things blooming March into, into April. And, and there, was, there was plenty of, of, work to, of work to do. So um, hopefully I'll be able to, um, to keep, the pruning, keep the pruning going off and on over the winter. Oh, you're not going to be traveling anywhere, so why not? Why not? Yeah. So that well, actually brings up a question that somebody had that that it, okay, that goes with the, the the arc of the year. Do you delay trimming back some things um, as a potential benefit for wildlife? It might not look as good, but that's my my comment. But but do you do you um when you're planning your garden cleanup, do you do you take that into consideration. I'm now I am now taking that into consideration. Yes. So, um, I mean, if you were to look at the uh, flower garden, probably fifteen to twenty percent of it hasn't been cut back. We'll let it. We'll let it go uh, into the spring, and then especially around the margins. Um, uh, here, I, there's. So this garden here, uh, no, nope, not that one, but this garden um, with the grasses and the alliums and so forth, that won't get cut back until 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 April. So it's it, again, it, it's sort of um, uh, case case by case. Okay, Bill, what's a half-hearted perennial? Did I hear you right? Half-hearty. <laughs> There are, lots of, there are lots of half-hearted perennials too. <laughs> Which ones is it? <laughs> uh, we, uh, we, we won't go there. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I don't think I have any, well, I have plenty more questions, but I can't think of what they all are. Um, let, me just, let me just scroll through. There are another couple of slides people haven't seen and um, and they're nice, you know, this nice fall vignette. And then we can end with the, um, uh, with the uh, book cover. And the, m maybe a word to say at, at the end is that um, this book got written in a time uh, for me of some personal challenges, some health challenges in, in our family. And at a time we, when we lost two long-term friends. And I signed the contract like the day after the 2016 presidential election. So this whole thing was written under a cloud. Um, and I sort of had to figure out how to, um, how to write myself out of a cloud. And, and the way I did that was to think about my work preserving gardens and that I knew that the gardens that I care about around the country are only going to survive is if people get involved and become passionate about them. And it needs to be young people to do that. It can't just be all of us 
older people who've been gardening for 40 years. And so I th those are the people that I was writing to in this book and, and hoping to encourage them to take an interest in plants and gardens and, and nature. And so this book comes out at a time that's far worse than when I was writing the book, but it's, it's at a time when I think people are open and receptive to nature and to being in gardens and to working uh, with their with their hands and and so I hope the book kind of lands in in those people's hands. Well, witness the fact that Renee's so all the seed companies sold out before what April fifteenth or something. This, there were no seeds to good seeds to get. Yeah. So you're right. And and it, it would be great if P and I mean, I'm sure people had lots of failures with those seeds this year. I did when I was younger, but I hope that people will persist and that the next year will, will give people additional reason to, um, to, to become even more passionate and involved in, in growing plants. Well, I have to tell you, sitting here December 1st, two things. I realized that in four months, we're going to be back at it. The snowdrops, everybody's going to, they're all going to be coming up again. But what a treat for my eyes to see all of those pictures flash by, those, that incredible garden, the green, the colors. Whew, it was just a little vacation. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I'm glad you all could join us. And um, the link to this, to uh, the book is in the um, chat and, or you just call the store, go to the website and Bill will sign books. I thought he was in the store wearing out his hand, signing books this afternoon. Um, and we invite you to sign up for our newsletter so you don't miss the next event, which is actually a week from now. Penny and I are going to be having a conversation about holiday picks. Um, and Basically, we thank you all for joining us and thank you so much, Bill. This has been a real treat. Thank you. Thank you, Liza, Penny. Thank Thanks. you, thank you. Oh, and the comments are, thank you, awe and delight. You're here. <laughs> so everybody's signing off.